Moschino Barbie doll fabulosity totally included. Hello, welcome back. Today I would like us to consider gender. This was a topic I wasn't really going to do a video on, but it keeps coming up time and time again. Usually in videos by gender activists, feminists, and of course, SJWs. The arguments they use are often convoluted, but is it such a complex issue as some claim it to be? I'm old enough to remember a time when the term gender simply referred to nouns. And if you think back to your school days, you might remember that there were in fact four genders. But we all know that today the primary focus of the gender warrior is fixed on masculine and feminine. Back in the dark ages when I went to school, the designation of male and female were species agnostic. Male and female were used to describe a bimodal population pattern and the traits correlated with it, and the terms masculine and feminine were used to describe male and female. But during the late 1960s and through the 1970s, a new definition and use of the term gender was minted. Social scientists, gender activists, and the ever opportunistic feminists co-opted the term gender, and in papers, publications, and the technical literature, they began to use the term to describe identity and behavioral bimodality, as distinct from biology. There is an obvious problem, and that is, gender bimodality is highly correlated with biological sex. The correlation is so strong that the names for the gender designations are the same as those used for sex designation. The use of sex and gender is understood by most people to be distinct. Even today, gender names still mirror the sex names, because of this exceptional correlation between both sets of terms. Yet still, it is all too easy to detect an increasing misapprehension between the terms sex and gender in everyday conversation. Progressive activists and advocates proceed as though the order that these terms came to be used can not only be reversed, but has somehow become prescriptive. Very often when listening to the debate, one can often conclude that the only explanation is that there is a deliberate obfuscation, almost certainly for ideological reasons. Little wonder, then, that young people struggle with what should be relatively simple concepts. This gender nonsense wouldn't really be that much of a problem, but the biological definitions of male and female have also become casualties in the progressive's gender jihad. We now find the concept of biological sex itself is now treated as an oppressive, prescriptive social construct, and not simply a descriptive category that it actually is. If we look at the definitions for name gender, for instance, that we find on the website nonbinary.org, we gain an insight into the intent behind the advocacy. According to nonbinary.org, your gender can be, and I quote, a gender that is best described by one's name, good for those who aren't sure what they identify as yet, but definitely know that they aren't cis. It can be used as a catch-all term for a specific identifier, e.g., John gender, Jane gender, your name here gender, etc. The example of name gender demonstrates how non-binary gender identities are supposed to operate and the function they perform. Such identities the definition proposes are for people who aren't sure what they identify as, but know that they are definitely not cisgender, presumably because they are far too interesting, avant-garde, or special for something as mundane and conventional as the normal designation, which one supposes is only fit for the rest of us. Some people, and one would assume that most subscribers to nonbinary.com would fall into this class, describe their own gender identity as non-binary, while the vast majority of people, on the other hand, would consider themselves as binary. That is, most people believe themselves as being either male or female. The argument often made by those who consider themselves as non-binary is that gender itself is not a binary, but a spectrum. The question is, if gender really is a spectrum, doesn't this make everyone non-binary by definition? 
If so, then the label itself, that of non-binary, used to describe a specific gender identity, would become redundant, because it would fail to categorise even those who would advocate its use. This is a non-trivial problem. It seems to me, those that argue the spectrum model do so having to assume that gender is both binary and a spectrum. It is possible for a property to be described as both continuous and discrete, so a property might be described as having a value which falls along some spectrum and still be considered, in certain circumstances, a binary. This might be confusing. How could something be a continuum yet be described as binary? Looking at a familiar example might be useful at this point. Because we're discussing humans, let's consider height. Clearly, height is a continuum and individuals can fall anywhere along that continuum. But often we use labels that describe height that can be considered binary. Someone can be tall or short. These are binary labels. Someone can be tall or short, but it makes no sense to claim they're both. But does gender, as most of us perceive it, operate in the same way? The thing is, the tall-short binary denotes a comparative description. Since height is a continuum, no individual is absolutely tall or absolutely short. We are all taller than some people and shorter than others. When we describe someone as tall, what we mean is that they are taller than some group average. For instance, a boy could be tall for a 10-year-old, but obviously shorter than most adult men and some teenagers. So we can think of the labels tall and short as comparative, and these labels only really make sense in reference to some group average. We might be mischievous at this point and describe those of average height, as being of non-binary height. This leads us nicely into another problem. If gender, like height, is to be understood as comparative or relative because it falls along a continuum, this seems to imply that individuals are not the sole arbiters of their own gender. Now it's true, I think, that many SJW types lean towards solipsism, but I would suggest that it is impossible to avoid comparison in relation to others if you claim a personal attribute is part of a continuum. Individual gender would be defined by reference to the distribution of gender identities present in the group in which you find yourself, and not by your own subjective self-determination. The label non-binary could not be a self-measured attribute, but could only be determined by comparing one's gender identity against the general distribution. In this scenario, if you consider yourself male, there may be a few or many individuals even more male than you. If you believe yourself non-binary, where exactly would you need to be along this proposed continuum to qualify? The obvious answer would, I suggest, be that you would need to be near the average, but not near one of the tails of the distribution. If we pursue this line of reasoning, we uncover Another issue. When we consider our height analogy, we can see that, when observing the entire population, only a small minority of people would be described as tall or short. Given that height really is a spectrum, the binary labels are comparative. Only a handful of people at either end of the spectrum can be meaningfully labelled tall or short. The rest of the population fall along all the points in between. These are the non-binary height people, and they are typical, while the tall and short are atypical. If we extend our analogy to gender, we would need to conclude that being non-binary gendered would actually be the norm and not the exception. If gender is a spectrum, that means it's a continuous range of values between two extremes. Everyone is located somewhere along that continuum. The label we use at the extreme ends of the spectrum are masculine and feminine, or male and female. Once we realise this, it becomes clear that everyone is non-binary, because absolutely nobody is pure masculine or pure feminine. Of course, some people will be closer to one end of the spectrum, while others will be more ambiguous and float around the centre. But even the most conventionally feminine person will demonstrate some characteristics that we would normally associate with masculinity and vice versa. Now we come to the issue of the label cisgender, because if one elects the label non-binary, it is in relation to the existence of a larger group of binary cisgender individuals, people who the non-binary individuals believe are incapable of escaping the arbitrary male-female genders enforced by society. 
There is something exquisitely ironic about people insisting that only they and a handful of their fellow gender warriors are non-binary and in so doing create a false binary between those who conform to gender norms and those who do not. If they truly believed in the gender spectrum model, then in reality they would have to concede that everyone is non-binary. So to call oneself non-binary is in fact to create a new binary class. But what would be the benefit of engaging in the cognitive gymnastics required to arrive at such a world view? Well, I suggest that if one does hold this view, you can position yourself on the more sophisticated, interesting and virtuous side of the binary that you've created. You can then claim to be both misunderstood and politically oppressed by the other, which in this instance is labelled cisgender. We can descend even further into the rabbit hole and discover gender activists who bail out of the gender spectrum altogether by declaring themselves agender, saying that they feel neither masculine nor feminine. We don't benefit from any cogent explanation as to why this is the case, but one thing seems obvious, that is, not everyone is allowed to do it. For the same reason, we cannot all call ourselves non-binary. If we were all to deny that we have an innate, essential gender identity, then the label agender would become redundant. The takeaway point here is that if you identify as agender, it can only be in relation to gender itself. So those who define themselves and their identity by their lack of gender must hold a view that while most people do have an innate and essential gender, they, for some unstated reason, do not. It is a key tenet of gender theory that the vast majority of people can be described as cisgender, which simply means that the gender matches sex. But if the gender activists are correct, it's not clear how anybody could be described as cisgender, because none of us could have been assigned a correct gender identity at birth. No one could possibly anticipate which gender identity would manifest in any particular individual. What conclusions might a reasonable person come to in all this? Firstly, just like in some mathematical operations, order of precedence is important. Biological sex really is a thing. It is simply a scientific fact, and it precedes gender. There is an extraordinary correlation between sex and gender, so much so that we even use the same terms to describe both. Even though sex and gender are highly correlated, they are not the same. They are distinct. And while for most people sex and gender are usually aligned, there are exceptions. But these exceptions do not break the rule. The male-female binary is still a valid approximation. And this is why I suggest that both sex and gender should be considered as bimodal. Even if we concede each and every point made by gender theorists, this would still leave us with a modified bimodal distribution of both sex and gender. The claim that gender is simply a social construction independent of biological sex is a nonsense, and a self-defeating nonsense at that. Because if you pursue that claim to its logical conclusion, then all one needs to do in order to address gender dysphoria is to re-socialize the individual. Do you see where this line of reasoning takes us as a society? If one can be socialized into a particular gender, one can be re-socialized out of that same gender expression. After all, it's simply a matter of an individual's subjective measurement. Might not society simply expect the individual to get with the program? Select your gender and stop complaining if you feel you've selected the wrong one. After all, it's not an immutable trait, is it? Why would anyone expect society to indulge what is essentially a personal preference? The answer to that would, I hope, be obvious. We end our adventure at this point. I hope you found something of interest in this video. If you would like to support my channel, I now have a Patreon page. If you're unable to support my work through Patreon, then you can share, like or comment. It's all good. Thank you for watching.